Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Sue G. Hi, Sue. And I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon. This morning, I decided that I would, I don't know why, I would write out my story. I was writing notes. And I never do that. And then at the end of it, what I came up with is, this is my story. I cannot fail. Let go and trust God will place in my heart the words to share with all of you. And I'm going with that plan. I have never written anything out, and I don't know what made me think that today should be anything different. Um, I like the name of this convention. Stand, what is it? Standing at a standing at a turning point. Because I had a turning point last week. I turned 60. Yes. <laughs> and I've been celebrating all August. I don't just celebrate one day. I celebrate all. And I'm very grateful to be able to sit, stand here and say that I turned 60 because um, I was somebody that thought I wasn't going to live past the age of 40. And I really wanted to die by the time I was 40. So it's a blessing. Each day I'm alive, and it's a blessing that I celebrate at 60. And in my mind, I'm not 60, so I don't really care. Um, so let me t- I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, um, of what I grew up with, but then I also like to focus on what I've gotten from recovery because I've gotten so much from recovery Um, I've gotten a life that I never thought that I would have. I came into program probably in 1984, but I did not stay. I came to a couple of meetings, and I left, and I went on vacation to Bermuda. And when I came back from Bermuda, I never came back to meetings. And it's funny, when I was thinking about it, You know, it's like I've told my story many times, but this piece I forgot, that when I went on vacation to Bermuda, my mother was actively drinking. And I started getting calls from her girlfriend that that my mother was in really bad shape. Now, I'm in Bermuda, and I'm trying to figure out how I can do something for my mother, who's back in Connecticut. And the rest of my trip was ruined. We actually ended up staying an extra day because... um, a Russian plane was on the tarmac, and we could, they couldn't move it. It was like an international thing. And I should have been enjoying with everybody else that, um, that I got an extra day in Bermuda. And I couldn't do that because I was obsessed with my mother. And that was the story of my life, growing up with alcoholism, that I was obsessed with my mother. And I forgot that, and that I came back from that trip, and I knew al was there, and I, and I didn't go back because I wasn't ready. And I don't beat myself up that I wasn't ready. It just wasn't my time, you know. But um, I was born into alcoholism. I don't ever remember a time when my mother did not drink. Um, I know that she used to have headaches, and they called uh, um, they would call it migraines. But I knew that it was the drinking. Um, she had these drinking buddies that I did not like. And her life evolved around drinking. I don't remember spending much time with my mother. She um, would honestly tell you that she didn't know what to do with children. And that's probably true because she only had one, which was me. And um, I spent a lot of time with my father. And I did a lot of things with him. I did hiking. I did, he did things with the community, with with the boys. And there'd be all these boys and then there'd be me. And I hung out with him, and um, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful that my father was there because it could have been a lot worse, you know. Um, But I can't say that my childhood was, like, all that horrible. There was fun times. I got my family's from Canada, my mother's family, and I would go and spend the summers with my grandmother, and uh, I loved doing that. And I just knew that there was something off, but I just didn't know what it was, you know, and that was fine. But as I went into my teens, that's when um, it became 
more noticeable that my mother was uh was still drinking and my mother was a mean drunk that I can say she was a mean drunk she liked to argue and she would follow you around it would be like she wants to argue so therefore I'm going to follow you we will argue and my father would take off and I couldn't go anywhere and so then we would argue and then my father would come home and he would tell us to go to separate rooms he would separate us and he would always say to me why don't you keep your mouth shut and so I grew up thinking that if I would just keep my mouth shut, if I just didn't say something, then everything would be okay. But my mother and I, we bumped heads a lot in my teens. Um, I also, my father was a policeman. And so he was a strict disciplinarian, and my mother wasn't. So there was a benefit to my mother being an alcoholic, is that when she was hanging out with her friends, I got to do what I want. You know, boundaries and guidelines didn't really stand. You know, when I got my car and I could start start driving, I had a curfew at 16. And that quickly went out the window because they told me that if you're going to be out late past 12, just call. Well, after a couple of weekends of calling and saying I'm going to be out past 12, it turned to just tell me where you're going to be. And so I could come rolling in at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. That was because my mother was drinking and she wasn't paying attention to that. There was no, rules just changed, you know. Um, my father, on the other hand, was on the police schedule. <laughs> I was grounded a lot, and then I would be put on probation. <laughs> just like the criminals, it was like, okay, you're on probation, you know, and then I'd go off and I'd get in trouble, trouble again. But during all that time, my one focus was my mother, my mother who was the drinker, you know. Um, I would think about how could I get my mother to stop drinking. So I would write letters. I would cry. Um, I always say if there was something that would make somebody stop drinking, I've said it, and I learned that there isn't, you know. Um, in the midst of all that, with my mother, unsavory characters that she had in her house, there was sexual abuse with these people. Um, I never told anybody, and um, I think something happened, and eventually they were just gone because something happened with my mother. So there was a lot of – alcoholism is ugly. I mean, there's no other way to describe it is that – Ugly things happen when people are drinking, and kids usually get the brunt of it because there's nobody to protect you, and that's what um, that's what I live with. I live. I it looked on the outside like everything was well. We had you know the nice house, and um, you know I was always dress coordinated and everything. But inside inside that house, there was a lot of a lot of chaos, you know. When I, I can remember getting off the school bus and coming in, and I would look to see what shape my mother was in. And if my mother was okay, then it was okay for me to breathe. And if she wasn't okay, then I would just creep into my room, and I spent a lot of time in my room. Um, growing up as an only child, I learned to amuse myself, so being in the room was not a bad thing to me. But I was very lonely. I was very, very lonely. And I remember my grandmother said that to my mother one time, that she's a very lonely child. And my, my mother was like upset that she said that because I think she took it that it was something against her. But I was. But I never said anything. I never said anything. Um, and I just continued on. But when I hit my teen years, as I say, then it was like everything, everything broke loose. And um, when I got my car, I used to go to New Haven. That was the big thing. I lived in North Haven, and I wanted to go to New Haven, and we spent a lot of time in New Haven, going to bars and things like that. And my um, social world was in the gay community. Um, I had a liking for being in the gay community. I'm not gay, but I loved hanging out with gay men. I felt that I was... Uh, that I was loved, I was worthy, um, they thought I was cool. What beats this? And <laughs> I had friends that they did the same thing. And that's what my social life was like in bars, in, in the gay world. 
And at 17, or probably 18, I got out of high school at 18, um, and that was at the height of my mother and I really, really fighting, and my father separating us, and, um, you know, my going out, and um, I remember going to my girlfriend's wedding. I went to my girlfriend's wedding, and I thought, wow, this is really, really nice, you know, and I said, wow, I want to get married. Now, I wasn't dating anybody, but, you know, I want to get married. So I left that wedding because I was going out. And again, I was going out to, to a gay club. And there was this guy. And this guy was actually, now he was gay. There was no doubt about it. But I met, it, met him during his straight period. <laughs> Again, that's what I call it, the straight period, you know. Now, when I first met him, I came up during around the disco age with the platform shoes and, you know, he had the fur coat on and stuff. And, and I knew his lover, but now he's going to be straight. And um, so we started dating. We started dating. That seemed like a good idea to me. <laughs> and... Um, I always say that we were two lost souls that should have stayed friends and never got married, you know. Um, he was trying to recover from a religion that's very, very strict, that um, that they look at it that being gay is like some curse from God, and I'm looking to get out the house. That's basically what it is. I'm looking to get out the house. So um, we were dating for like about six months, and I remember when he said to me, well, I think we should get married. And I was like, okay. Now, I've gone to meetings, uh, gone to weddings with Al Anon people, and, um, and they've shared the thought that's gone into it, to the decision to get married. And I'm like, wow, because that was not what I did. It was like, sure, we'll get married. I don't know why, but we'll get married. And then he said, you know, I said, well, we'll get married in a year. And he said, why a year? And I said, I don't know. That's what everybody else does. That's how clueless I was of why I was doing this. And so we did. We got married. And I lived a lie. I lived a lie. First of all, the only friends that knew that he was that I had met him at a gay bar were my friends that were hanging out in the gay bar with me. To everybody else at work in the outside world, we looked like a normal, a normal couple here. You know that um, we had a house. We had a dog and a cat, you know, and we were married for like about three years. And all that time, there was still alcoholism circling around in my, um, in my mother, and I was still obsessed with her, because that was the one thing that I could not let go of, was my mother's drinking, you know. After three years, he came and he said to me, he said, you know, I need to be true to myself, um, and I, I am gay, and I need to go live as what I'm supposed to be, a gay man. And I remember, because this is how sick I was, I remember saying to him, well, you know, you can go do that and we could stay married. And it's like, but you can go and have your relationships on the side. That shows how much, how I did not think of myself. I did not think I was worthy of having somebody that loved me, that just loved me and wasn't going to play around. And that I wanted to be with somebody that didn't want to be with women. So... You know, when he said to me, he says, you know, you deserve better. And it was like he swore at me. I really wanted to hit him upside the head. It's like, how dare you tell me I deserve better? But he was right. He was right. Uh, so we ended up splitting up. And I remember, you know, as I said, I was so young in the head. I really was. And I remember telling my mother and, you know, she said to me, honey, do you want to come home? And I said, yes. And so he went to work one day, and the truck came, and I cleaned out the house. And he came home, and I could hear, the, hear it echoing that um, there's no furniture. And he told me, he said his friends told him, watch out, she's being too nice. Uh, but I couldn't keep everything, and I did give some of it back. But I did. I went back home, and I think I stayed with my mother again for probably about seven or eight years. And at that time, then my, my father decided that he couldn't stay married any longer. 
to her, and he actually was having an affair with somebody, and he left. And I was so pissed at him, and I was pissed because I felt like he left me with the alcoholic and like I was doomed. I felt like I had a rock around my neck which was the alcoholic, and there was nothing I could do about it. And that's where the feeling of wanting to die came from, because I could not see any way better than death to get out of that situation. And it did change that my mother was nicer because of the fact that she knew that I would leave the home. So the dynamic changed, but still I worried about my mother. I still worried about her driving and um, and all that. And during that time, my mother did try to commit suicide, and I actually had the thought that I should let her, and I remember thinking that, and I remember calling my uncle in Canada to ask him what should I do, and he told me to call 911 because I couldn't figure out how to do um, to do that myself because I really had that thought, this was my way to get out, was that I would let her go. So I did. I called 911, and they came and they got her. And that did not stop. That did not stop the drinking, you know. Um, So a friend of mine actually, which is funny, I grew up with her since I was five years old. And, you know, alcoholism is a disease of secrets. And we... uh, I knew her since I was five, and we never talked about the alcoholism. Her father was an alcoholic, and my mother was an alcoholic, and we never came up. She needed a place to stay, and she came, and she moved into my house. She moved into my house, and she could see my mother drinking, and she could see it. And she actually was going to meetings. She was going to meetings, and um, she had bought the One Day at a Time book. And she had left it on the table, and my mother saw it. And we figured that my mother thought that she was going because of her. And she came, my girlfriend came home, and my mother told her that she had to move out within three days. She didn't care if she knew where she was going or anything. It was just that she had to get out the house because the secret was about to be broken. And my mother thought somebody already knew about it. And so my girlfriend Molly said to me, she said, it's okay. She said, but you may want to try going to this meeting I go to, Al-Anon. She was going to Al-Anon because she was involved with somebody in the NA program. And so she was going to Al-Anon and Naranon. And so I, my first meeting was the Wednesday night meeting in North Haven. And so I went, and I thought that was great. I was like, wow, this is really cool, you know. Um, And so I did. I went to meetings, and I remember, you know, that, um, I don't know, the alcoholic in my life life never said, oh, go with my blessing. She actually would say, I want to go grocery shopping at 825. And at that time, meetings were like at 830 at night. And, um, And I would say, no, I'm going to my meeting. And so I did. I went for a couple of months, and then that's when I went on, went on vacation And then I came back and never went back. But it was always circling in my head. So I call that my time that I went out to see if I could make my life a whole lot worse. And trust me, there is always more damage that you can do. And I did it. And so I went back out for like two years, not thinking about the program, and I scared myself. I scared myself because... I actually started drinking, and I don't like to drink, but I was going out, and I was drinking by myself, and um, and I was doing drugs, and I'll be honest and say I like doing drugs because it didn't have a taste, and I always say that God gave me the gift of being cheap, that I will not spend money on drugs, (laughs) so that probably saved me from myself. I'll buy myself a pair of shoes, but I would not buy drugs, (laughs) so... um, so yes, yeah, so I uh so that scared me when I saw myself sitting in a bar by myself ordering wine and I don't like to drink, you know. And I was looking in the paper and I saw at that time when I came back in eighty six, adult children of alcoholics, Al Anon meetings were very, very big, and there was a woman that was advertising that she works with adult children, um, a therapist. And 
So I just happened to cross it, and, and I called her. And so I went and I talked to her, and she interviewed me. And um, what she told me was that she would, she asked me, was there alcoholism in my background? And I said, yes. And she told me that she would not work with me unless I went back to Al-Anon, that she would help me, but that I had to go to Al-Anon. And so that's how I ended up coming back to Al-Anon. The other thing is she said to me, she asked me, do you drink? And I said, yes. I said, yeah, I said, but I don't really like it. I said, I just keep trying until I find something I like. And she said to me, does that make sense with your history? And I said, I guess it doesn't. And I stopped. So the next, Wednesday, next week I went to a meeting. Now, you would think I'd go back to the Wednesday meeting in North Haven. But no, I'm going to find one in Fairfield because I don't want people to know. And I don't want them to say, where have you been? Like they're going to. Okay, so I try to find this meeting. I'm driving around some dark road. I can't find it. Following week where I end up back up where I started at the Wednesday meeting um, in North Haven. And I ran into a friend that I met the first time. And she walked up and she just hugged me and said, glad to see you. And that's what Al-Anon has been for me is that um, it's a safe place to come back to and people just say, how you doing? And so... With that, I committed to staying in the meetings because I had nothing else. I was at the bottom. I wanted, basically, I wanted my life to end. Um, I was serious about staying committed to coming back to the meeting. I remember going to Boston, and I went to visit a girlfriend, and I said, well, I have to leave because i got to go to my Sunday night meeting, and I drove back. But I also remember thinking, as I go across the train track, if the train hit me, I don't have to go to the meeting. And um, because most of my disease is in my head and I have really crazy thoughts and that was one of them. And as you can tell, the train didn't hit me. So I went to the meeting and but that was what I had to do for me. It was important that once I decided that I wanted um, recovery, that I had to go. And it was funny when I first came to Al-Anon, all the God stuff really put me off. And the one day at a time book. I'm here to tell you, is really hard to read around the God stuff. There's a lot of God in there. and um, But the second time when I came back, it was the higher power and the spiritual um, part of it that saved my life. That was what I connected with. And that's what I wanted because when I looked around the rooms, the people that seemed the happiest and seemed to be living life were the ones that were talking about having a higher power, have, believing in something bigger than themselves. And I wanted that. And when I came in, there was like a lot of, you know, it's funny, there's a group of us now that we talk and we say, we're the old timers. And we're like, oh, how did that happen? You know, but when we came in, there was these women that were the old timers. And it was a little different than it is today because they, they basically told you, you do stuff. There was no such, there was no such thing as like, well, would you like to, you know? So I ended up going to like conventions in New Hampshire and Maine. It was sort of like, Sue, meet us at this parking lot and you're going. And I would go. I would go. And the funniest thing, my mother would say, you know what? If something happened, I wouldn't even know how to get in touch with you, which was true because you have no last names. She don't know who these people are. And, um, but I would go because that's what they told me to do. Um, when they told me to do service, I did it. I made a lot of coffee. I feel sorry for the people that drank that coffee because I didn't drink coffee, so I have no idea what it tasted like, but the beauty of Al-Anon is people smile at you and tell you it's okay anyway, you know? Um, and that helped to build my self-esteem. You know, that, that really helped me. Um, so I continued to go, and... There was a service position that opened up. There used to be a Friday night uh, at the Al-Anon adult children meeting, and they needed a, a GR. They needed a GR. And, you know, I always operated from the thought that I'm not going to criticize anybody for not doing something if I'm not willing to do it myself. So if somebody is not willing to do service, if I'm not willing to step up and do it, then I need to keep my mouth shut. And so there was this opening for a GR, so I said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And so I was GR of this meeting. And i got to tell you, being GR of an adult children of alcoholics meeting is really something. 
um, because we are adult children and we want people to take care of us and you learn how to tell people to, to, to set boundaries and to ask for help and, um, you know, just be vocal. But it was a great experience for me. And I remember our first anniversary that we had, um, we brought in all these stuffed animals. It was the height of the stuffed animal thing. I'm so glad that's over. <laughs> but <laughs> and we came in with these stuffed animals, and we didn't have food like at a grown-up Al-Anon meeting. We had sugar. We had so much candy that you could be on a sugar high for a week. We were true adult children. But that is where I learned how to socialize one with people with my own age. And there was another meeting in Branford, a big adult children of Al-Anon meeting, adult children meeting. And we would do things outside of the meeting. You know, I remember going to picnics and, you know, on Friday night we would go down to Clark's and have something to eat, you know, because all of us were really used to just hanging out at night. And so we had no place to go. So we would go and we could continue the meeting. But it taught me how to have relationships with people my own age. And I'm very grateful for that, you know. After three years, I started to feel like there was something that was blocking me, and I couldn't figure out what it was. And um, I do have a history of depression, and so the depression was setting in, and I was, like, thinking, something's wrong here. And I was, like, you know, standing on a bridge across the Merritt Parkway was underneath, and I'm, like, thinking, Wow, that looks pretty good, and that scared me. But I was in therapy, and so I talked to her about it. But I was going to, on Saturday morning, there used to be this um, AA women's meeting. It was an open meeting, and these women were sharing, and they were sharing honestly about things that were going on with them. And one of the things that they were sharing about was was the fact that some of them had been sexually abused. And at that point in time, I was ready to hear that. And so from that I went and got help for that because I do believe that not all things belong in Al-Anon, but Al-Anon has been the, the, the jump off point for me to go and get the help that I need. That with the foundation with Al-Anon, I've been able to go out and seek that help. And that was a real gift for me to be able to go and do that because that was the piece that was blocking me. I needed to deal, deal with that. I would like to say that my husband was the last gay man that I had a relationship with. But that was not the case. But this time I did not meet them in a gay bar. <laughs> um, it was a recovery person, and they, would, through their recovery, they realized that they, that they were gay. And we were talking about getting married, and we were looking for places to live together and stuff. And then he came and he told me that. And it was during that time when I was still going for help with that. And somehow... I knew that that was the last time that that would happen to me, and I'm very grateful to say that that is. I have never encountered another relationship with a man that um, that was gay, and I believe that that's because I did the work, um, that my energy changed, and now I'm more I'm, I'm open, um, and I get that from Al-Anon. I get that from Al-Anon. Um, so some of the things that I think of that, that have happened that, that are amazing to me that keeps me coming to the program is the fact that um, life happens. Life happens and things continue to happen. When I turned 40, I decided that I wanted to meet the other half of my family. My mother was married um, before, and she left my father when I was a year old. My father that I grew up is really my stepfather, but he's the man that raised me, and he's my father in my heart. But I wanted to meet my family. And Al-Anon has made me aware of, like, when I feel that there's energy moving, that I need to do something. And so I um, looked them up. I looked them up, and they, lived in the, they live in Niagara Falls, New York. And I just got the phone book, and I called someone with the last name, and it happened to be my father's brother. And I called him, and he he started crying, and he said, I'm your uncle. And he um, gave me my father's number. And I called my father, and, you know, it was no Oprah moment. It was sort of like, hi, it's your daughter, <laughs> you know. 
And he was like stunned, you know, but that opened up another, you know, it's like, that's why I love that standing at the turning point. That was another turning point for me, you know, that I needed, that I needed to do. Now, I got to say that the reason I did it, part of it was, is that, you know, I watch a lot of soaps and people end up dating their brother. So I want to know who these siblings were to make sure that I didn't end up falling in love with my brother. So I'm still a little crazy, but, and so we made arrangements and I came up to meet him, meet them in October. And before I went, my brother and I, we just connected. He was like about a year younger than me and we connected. And, um, he told me that he had AIDS and Actually, I think I told him, he said, I got something to tell you. And I said, you've got AIDS, don't you? And he said, yes, you know. Um, the part of my story that I forgot is that with my, with my ex-husband, we did become friends later on. And he actually did end up getting HIV and AIDS. And my mother was the one who found out from someone that he did. And I called him and I said to him, I said, I, I understand a friend of mine has, has AIDS. And he said, yes, I do. And I was able to be part of my... Um, of my ex-husband's life and go visit him while he was sick and that was very healing we made amends to each other he made amends to me and I made amends to him because even though in my mind I'm perfect I know that I wasn't and so that really helped me and then when he passed I was able to go you know and celebrate his life with his friends you know um, but a couple of years later now I have my brother that 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 is and my brother was an addict, and he was hooked on cocaine, and he had stopped. But as his disease, the AIDS progressed, he went back to his addiction. And Al-Anon really helped me with that. Al-Anon helped me because it helped me to set boundaries because he was using. And what would happen is he had the – it was affecting his brain, and they would come and they would give him chemo in the brain, you know, give him chemo, the home care nurse, and then he would be out the door to go use his drugs. And it was hard to watch. And so what did I do? I went to Al-Anon meetings in Niagara Falls, New York. You know, I found myself some meetings, and it was so cool. And the funny thing was is I remember driving back and stopping at a rest stop, and all of a sudden I hear these people screaming my name, and they were the Al-Anon members from Niagara Falls. They were on their way to their convention in Albany. They were like, Susan, Susan. And I was like, who is that, you know? But for me, I know to stay close to the program when something, when, tri when trials are happening. And I feel close to my higher power when trials are happening. I find that that's what works. That's a gift I feel I have, is that I don't turn away and think, God, why is this happening? I turn closer to God when those things are happening. And that's what I did with my brother and um, my stepmother and I, we developed a close relationship taking care of, um, taking care of my brother. And the last time that I went up that he was supposed to come back and visit, I had to set an Al-Anon boundary because he was using, and he was using a lot. And I knew that he was pretty sick and that if he didn't come to visit me then, that there was a good possibility that he would not be able to come to Connecticut again. And I had to tell him that because he was using that I could not bring him to my home. And that hurt my heart that I had to do that, you know. And his mother was devastated because she was looking to have a break. But I couldn't do it. And I got the strength to do that from Al-Anon because I knew I could not have somebody in my home that was using that I'm going to work and I don't know what's going on. And by May, he was bedridden. And by September, he had passed away, you know. But I look at that, that God gave me the gift of being able to call my family and get to know my brother for three years. And during that three years time, we went to California we went, um, he would come down to visit me often, and it was like we were playing catch-up, that we were playing catch-up. And so I have the ability to say that I know that I met my brother Keith, that my sisters, they don't talk about him, and I don't know him, you know. Um, my, bro my biological father died probably a couple of years after, um, after my brother. Um, I like meeting my father. It was more like meeting an uncle because to me, as I said, my, the father that raised me, 
was in Connecticut, but, you know, it was really nice to meet him, you know. He was a very quiet man, and he would just sit there and smile at me. That's all he would do. I met a grandmother I didn't know. She'd sit there and smile at me. You know, it was like, it like opened up my world. It was like funny because my mother would say, I'm always trying to find, I'm always trying to get rid of my family. She was, and she said, you're out there collecting them. (laughs) And I think that's probably the only child in me is like, you know. And the amazing thing is that I remember sitting in my room as a child thinking, I really wish I had a sister that was my age. And today I can say that I do. I have a sister, Paula, that's a year younger than me. And um, we are so close. It's funny. We went to New York last weekend, still celebrate my birthday. And um, and they asked something. I was filling out something because I was buying something. And they said something about family. And she said, I'm her family. You know, it's like we still get a kick out of it. It's only been, you know what, because it's 20 years, but I have more years of being an only child versus having siblings. And it's the same thing for her. So we're still in awe of the fact that we're in each other's life. But I consider that a blessing that that has happened. Um, Also, I went back to school. Eight years ago, I went back to school and got my bachelor's degree, which was a big thing for me because I hated school. I hated it. But I realized that because of alcoholism, there really was no way I could concentrate at school because my thoughts were always on my mother. They And they would say, you know, if Sue would just concentrate, she could be an A student. But I spent a lot of time looking out the window. And that's what I would do. I would daydream, and I would look out the window. And um, so I did. I went back to school, and that was because of Al-Anon. People said to me, they said, you can do it. You've got the strength to do that. And so I did. I went back, and... Unfortunately, at that time, my mother got sick. My mother died from the disease of alcoholism. And she actually, my mother, they called it anorexia, elderly anorexia. She died. She was 66 pounds. My mother stopped eating. And um, when she went into the hospital, she never never came back home. She ended up in a nursing home. Um, but it was the alcohol. Her body just couldn't take it anymore. And I am so grateful for Al-Anon because Al-Anon, changed my relationship with my mother because I'm the person who needed to call somebody in Canada to find out if I should call 911 to save her. You know, I'm the person who, you know, I hated my mother. And when I came in, I would tell you, I hate my mother. And for me to be able to actually be there for my mother and take care of my mother is a miracle. And I always said that if I got nothing else out of Al-Anon from that, that 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 was the gift, you know. Um, but what al gave me during that was, one, I always take on a service commitment when something happens like that. So I think I became GR for a year of Sunday because I do something to keep myself connected because it's very easy for me to float away. But I choose to take a service commitment. I did it during my brother when he was sick, and I did it with my mother. And I would call, um, I would call and I would talk to one of my uh, – I call her my spiritual sister. Um, She works a good program, and whenever I'm spinning off, if I need some spiritual um, advice, I call her. And so I would call her, and I would say, you know, my mother's not eating, and she's not listening to me, and and then she would say to me, well, did she ever listen to you? In that calm, straight voice she could say, and I would be like, well, no, you know. And that would help me, you know, and it helped me to be able to let my mother be able to choose the way that she wanted to pass. Uh, My mother did not want to eat. I found that you cannot make somebody eat any more than you can make somebody stop drinking. If they don't want to eat, there's not really much you can say or do. I gained weight because I was eating what I was bringing her, (laughs) but, um, but she wasn't eating it, you know. But I am very grateful that Al-Anon gave me the ability to have that relationship with my mother. And I can always remember my mother saying, I love you. And I remember when she was getting ready to pass, she looked at me and she said, I love you, but you can do this. And that was a real gift. That was a real gift. And and I was going to stop going to school at that point in time because I was taking care of her. And she told me, don't, don't do that. She said, you keep going. And I did. And I graduated. And her sister came down. <laughs> her sister came down and... um came to my graduation, um, 
and I was very, very happy about that, you know. Um, life is, it has been hard. I've had things that have happened, but through the program, my attitude, I have been able to change it, you know. This year, I went to my first um, Al-Anon International Convention. I went to Vancouver. Uh, my um, cousin lives out in Vancouver, and I told my aunt I was thinking of going to the convention out in Vancouver, and she jumped on it, and she was like, well, we can go visit my cousin at the same time. And so we went for a week. You know, those are the opportunities that come to me when um, when I am working my program, you know. Um, I have gone into, I do need to mention that I've gone into like another recovery program for my eating. I eat like my mother drank. I am an emotional eater, and I need support with that, and that's how the disease has come up with me, is that, you know, I don't use alcohol, but I definitely can use food. And again, Al-Anon for me has given me the courage and strength to go and get the help that I need, you know, that I don't have to suffer. I remember the woman that I work with, the, the, the therapist that I work with, she said, Sue, there is no reason to suffer. And that is my goal today is to not suffer. It's like things happen, but I have tools that I know that I can do. You know, I know that for me to leave the house in the morning, I need to take the time to pray with my higher power, which is what I did this morning. I do my journaling. I do my readings. You know, these are the foundations of taking care of myself that I need to do. Sometimes I think, God, I wish I could just get out of the house without having to do all that. But the bottom line is, is that when I do that, I feel much better. My life goes better, you know. Um, and so I do it. You know, I practice the program. Do I do it perfectly? No. But um, it's a blessing. So I know that when Rick called and asked me, you know, or he sent me the email. And I remember he said, I still have it. I think he said, oh, well, boy, you seem real excited. <laughs> you know, and I said, yeah. I was thinking, yeah, he must think I'm an idiot, you know, because I was. I was like, yeah, you know. But you know what? That's because I've gotten so much, you know, out of, um, out of Al-Anon. I got the life that I never thought that I would have, that I would be pain-free that I can tap into the joy, you know, and the wonder of um, of life, you know, that I don't work around dark and gloomy. I have a friend that, sa you s that says, you know, that you can look back and don't stare. I don't stare anymore. I can't change what happened, but it's part of me. It's part of me. And I keep coming to Al-Anon because people said to me when my mother passed, they were like, well, you don't have to come anymore because the alcohol is gone. And I said, you do not want to be around me if I don't go to Al-Anon. <laughs> I can tell you that, you know, because that behavior, I have more years of that chaotic thought process and that behavior than I do. And I need the repetition. I need the repetition, and I think it's important to be here for new people that come in or people that come back like I did, you know. Like I came back, and there was a woman there that I knew, and she said, welcome back, you know. And um, I've had it where people have come back into the rooms, and they're like, oh, it's really good to see that somebody I knew was still there. You don't think it, but when you hear that, it's like, yes, because um, if we all decided not to, not to come back, you know, where we, where we would be. And it's funny, I remember I used to wonder where GRs go. Because <laughs> sometimes, you know, it seems like after the change, the GRs would disappear. You know, the people that were GRs, they would disappear. And um, I used to think, where do they go? You know, but there are a lot of GRs that I, a lot of people that I know that have done service, that they continue to do service. And when I finished doing my service of GR, at the Saturday morning meeting, I decided that it was time for me to make coffee because for me, it's important for me to stay humble and humble is making coffee, that I'm not better than anybody else. I'm not, you know, that I can make coffee. Hopefully I make better coffee than I did when I first came in. But, um, you know, it's service. It keeps the meetings going because I would never want to have a time when Al-Anon was not here because Al-Anon has given me the life that I never expected. And I look around and I see a lot of friends and I've been around for so long. I've been in for like something like 27 years. It's the longest commitment in my life. My male relationships have never lasted that long. And, um, 
and I just keep coming and I've gone to conventions and I know people from like all over the state and it's, um, I would have never got that. I was the kid who thought that the friends you had were the friends you had from high school and you didn't make any more. I don't know where I got that thought and Al-Anon showed me that that is totally not true, that there are still plenty of people to meet and plenty of people that want to meet you and um, I'm very grateful for that. So thank you for letting me come and share my story with you. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.